This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. When you follow your friends on Facebook or run a search on Google, what information comes up and what gets left out? That's the subject of a new book by Eli Pariser called The Filter Bubble, What the Internet is Hiding from You. According to Pariser, the Internet is increasingly becoming an echo chamber in which websites tailor information according to the preferences they detect in each viewer. Yahoo News tracks which articles we read, Zappos registers the type of shoes we wear, we prefer, and Netflix stores data on each movie we select. The top 50 websites collect an average of 64 bits of personal information each time we visit and then custom designs their sites to conform to our perceived preferences. While these websites profit from tailoring their advertisements to specific visitors, users pay a big price for living in an information bubble outside of their control. Instead of gaining wide exposure to diverse information, we're subjected to narrow online filters. Eli Pariser is the author of The Filter Bubble, What the Internet's Hiding from You. He's also the board president and former executive director of the group MoveOn.org. Eli joins us in the New York studio right now after a whirlwind tour through the United States. <laughs> Welcome, Eli. Thanks for having me on. So I, this may surprise people. Two of us sitting here, me and Juan, if we went online, the two of us, and put into Google Eli Pariser, Right. We actually might come up with a totally different set of um, of find uh, of um, uh, a, a totally different set of links of search results. That's right. I, I was surprised. I didn't know that that was uh, you know how it was working until I stumbled across a little uh, blog post on Google's blog that said personalized search for everyone. And as it turns out, for the last several years. Uh, you know, there is no standard Google. There's no sort of a, this is the link that is the, the best link. Uh, it's the best link for you. And the definition of what the best link for you is, is the thing that you're the most likely to click. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's not necessarily what you need to know. It's what you want to know, what you're most likely to click. But isn't that counter to the original thing that brought so many people to Google, that the algorithms that Google had developed really were were reaching out to the best available information that was out there on the web? Yeah. The, you know, if you look at how they talked about the original Google algorithm, they actually talked about it in these explicitly democratic terms, that the web was kind of voting, each page was voting on each other page and how, how credible it was. And this is really a, a departure from that. This is moving more toward uh, you know, something where, where each person can get very different results based on what they click on. And when I did this recently with Egypt, I had two friends Google Egypt. One person gets uh, search results that are full of information about the protests there, about what's going on politically. The other person, literally nothing about the protests, only sort of uh, travel to see the pyramids websites. Now, wait. Explain that again. I mean, that is astounding. So you go in, the uprising is happening in Egypt. Right. In fact, today there's a mass protest in Tahrir Square. They're protesting the military council and other issues. So if I look and someone who likes to travel look, they may not even see a reference to the uprising? That's right. I mean, there was nothing in the top 10 links. And, and uh, you know, what actually the way that people use Google, most people use just those top three links. So if Google isn't showing you sort of the information that you need to know pretty quickly, you, you can really miss it. Uh, and this isn't just happening at Google. It's happening all across the web. When I started looking into this, uh, you know, it's happening on most major websites and increasingly on news websites. So Yahoo News does the exact same thing, tailoring what you see on Yahoo News to which articles it thinks you might be interested in. And, you know, what's what's concerning about this is that it's really happening invisibly. You know, we don't uh, see this at work. You can't tell how different the Internet that you see is from the Internet that anyone else sees is. Uh, but it's getting increasingly different. Well, what about the, re the uh, responses of those who run these search engines that they're merely responding to the, uh, to the interests and needs of the people who use the system? Well, you know, I think that it, it, they say, we're just giving people what we want. And I say, well, what do you mean by what, what we want? Because I think actually all of us want a lot of different things. And uh, there's a short-term sort of compulsive uh, self that clicks on the celebrity gossip and the, you know, 
uh, uh, more trivial articles, and there's a longer-term self that wants to be informed about the world and be a good citizen. And those things are in tension all the time. They're, they're uh, you know, we, we have those two forces inside us. And uh, the best media helps us sort of it helps the long-term self get an edge a little bit. It, it, it uh, you know, gives us some information vegetables and some information dessert. And uh, you get a balanced information diet. This is like you're just surrounded by, by empty calories, by information junk food. Eli, talk about your experience going on your own Facebook page. So uh, this was actually the starting point for looking into this, uh, you know, phenomenon. And Basically, I, after 2008, uh, and after I had transitioned out of being the executive director of Move On, I, you know, went on this little campaign to meet and befriend people who thought differently from me. I really wanted to hear what conservatives were thinking about, what they were talking about, you know, and, and learn a few things. And so I had added these people as Facebook friends, and I logged on one morning and noticed that they weren't there. They had disappeared. And it was very mysterious, you know, where did they go? And as it turned out, Facebook was tracking my behavior on the site. It was looking at every click. It was looking at every, you know, Facebook like. And it was saying, well, Eli, you say that you're interested in these people, but actually we can tell you're clicking more on the progressive links than on the conservative links. So we're going to edit it out, edit these folks out. And they disappeared. And this gets to some of the danger of this stuff, which is that you know, have, Facebook edited out <laughs> your friends. Yeah, no, I, I, I really, you know, I, I miss them, and and uh, uh, your conservative friends. My conservative friends, the friends that you know that I might, and and the, what the, the the play here is 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 uh, you know there's this thing called confirmation bias, which is basically our tendency to feel good about information that confirms what we already believe. And, you know, you can actually see this in the brain. People get a little dopamine hit when they're told that they're right, essentially. And so, it, you know, if you were able to construct an algorithm that uh, could show people whatever you wanted, and if the only purpose was actually to get people to click more and to view more pages, why would you ever show them something that, you know, makes them feel uncomfortable, makes them feel like they may not be right, makes them feel like uh, there's, there's more to the world than our own little narrow ideas? And doesn't that, in effect, uh, reinforce polarization within the society in terms of people not being exposed to and listening to the viewpoints of others that they may disagree with? Right. I mean, you know, democracy really requires this idea of, of discourse, of people hearing uh, different ideas and responding to them and thinking about them. And, you know, I come back to this famous uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan quote where, where he says, uh, it, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. It's increasingly possible to live in an online world in which you do have your own facts, and you Google climate change, and you get the climate change links for you. And, it, you know, you don't actually get exposed necessarily. You don't even know what the alternate arguments are. Now, what about the implications for this as all of these, uh, uh, especially Google, Yahoo, develop their own news sites? What, what are the implications in terms of the news that they put out then and the, and the news that people receive? Well, this is where it gets even more worrisome because, uh, you know, when you're just basically trying to get people to click things more and view more pages, there's a lot of things that just isn't going to meet that threshold. So, you know, take uh, news about the war in Afghanistan. Um, when you talk to people who run news websites, they'll tell you stories about the war in Afghanistan don't perform very well. They don't get a lot of clicks. People don't, uh, you know, flock to them. And yet, this is arguably one of the most important issues facing the country. We owe it to the people who are there, at the very least, to understand what's going on. But it'll never make it through uh, these filters. And especially on Facebook, this is a problem because the, the way that information is transmitted on Facebook is with the like button. And the like button it has a very particular valence. It's easy to click like on, uh, you know, I just ran a marathon or I baked a really awesome cake. It's very hard to click like on, uh, you know, war in Afghanistan it enters its sixth year or uh, tenth year, sorry. Uh, you know, so. Information that is likable gets transmitted. Information that's not likable falls out. 
We're talking to Eli Pariser, who's written the book, The Filter Bubble, What the Internet is Hiding from You. Now, Google knows not only what you're asking to search, right? They know where you are. They know the kind of computer you're using. Tell us how much information they're gathering from us. Well, it's, a, it's really striking. I mean, even if you're not, if you're logged into Google, then Google obviously has access to all of your email, all of your documents that you've uploaded, a, a lot of information. But even if you're logged out, an engineer told me that there are 57 signals that Google tracks. Signals is sort of their word for variables that they look at. Um, everything from your computer's IP address, that's basically its address on the internet, what kind of laptop you're using or, or computer you're using, uh, what kind of software you're using, even things like the font size or uh, how long you're hovering over a particular link. And they use that to develop a profile of you, a sense of what kind of, what kind of person is this. And then they use that to tailor the information that they show you. And it, this is happening in a whole bunch of places, uh, you know, not just sort of the main Google search, but also on Google News. And, and the plan for Google News is that once they sort of perfect this, this personalization algorithm, that they're going to offer it to other news websites so that all of that data can be brought to bear for any given news website, that it, you know, it, it can tailor itself to you. Um, you know, there are really important things that are going to fall out if those algorithms aren't really good. And what this raises is this sort of larger problem with how we tend to think about the Internet, which is that we tend to think about the Internet as this sort of medium where anybody can connect to anyone. It's this very democratic medium. It's a free-for-all. Uh, and it's, it's so much better than that old society with the gatekeepers that were controlling the flows of information. Really, that's not how it's panning out. And what we're seeing is that a couple big companies are really, you know, most of the information is flowing through a couple big companies that are acting as the new gatekeepers. These algorithms do the same thing that the human editors do. They just do it much less visibly and with much less accountability. And the, what are the uh, options, uh, the opt-out options, if there are any, for those uh, who use, uh, uh, whether it's Google or Yahoo or Facebook, uh, their ability to control and keep their personal uh, information? Well, uh, you know, th there aren't perfect opt-out options because even if you take a new laptop out of the box, already it says something about you, that you bought a, a Mac and not a PC. I mean, it's very hard to get entirely out of this. There's no way to turn it off uh, entirely at Google. But certainly you can open a private browsing window. That helps. Uh, I think in the long run, you know, there's sort of two things that need to happen here. One is, uh, you know, we need ourselves to understand better what's happening, because it's very dangerous when you have these kinds of filters operating and you don't know what they're ruling out that you're not even seeing. That's sort of a, that's, that's where people make bad decisions is, you know, what Donald Rumsfeld called the unknown unknowns, right? Uh, and this creates a lot of unknown unknowns. You don't know how your experience of the world is being edited. But, uh, it, you know, it's, it's also a, a matter of pushing these companies to sort of, uh, you know, th these companies say that they want to be be good, don't be evil, is Google's motto. They want to change the world. I think we have to push them to sort of live up to their best values as companies uh, and incorporate into these algorithms more than just this very narrow idea of what, you know, of, of, of what is.